Between 1774 and 1789, the men in the United States convened for what's known as the Continental Congress. They decided to get together because they were tired of having their rights and liberties being violated. And that Continental Congress led them to write the Declaration of Independence, which as we know was the, was the catalyst for the American Revolutionary War. The men went on to win the American Revolutionary War and gained their rights and freedoms. During the same time, women were actively involved in politics, serving as advisors, all the while maintaining their primary role as nurturer for their families. However, they weren't afforded the same rights and freedoms as men. And it's not as if they didn't want it. In fact, women like Abigail Adams pleaded with her then husband, with her husband John Adams, and said, remember the ladies and be generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. John Adams went on to become the president and sadly forgot about the ladies. 144 years later, the British suffragist movement would start to influence the women in the United States. And in 1920, women in the United States gained the right to vote. However, there were still people who were left behind. And the people that were left behind were minorities. It wasn't until 1955 when Rosa Parks stood up during the civil rights movement and spoke on behalf of African Americans that minorities were given the right to vote. Now, part of the problem was that during this era, most occupations, nearly 38% of the women that were working, had occupations that were limited to being nurses, teachers, and secretaries. If they weren't doing that, then only 6% of them were American doctors, 3% were lawyers, and 1% were engineers. It didn't help that they had sentiments like this one expressed by a medical school dean who said, hell yes, we have a quota. We do keep women out when we can. We don't want them here, and they don't want them elsewhere either, whether or not they're willing to admit it. And it was sentiments like this that led to the second wave of feminism during the 1960s and 1970s, spearheaded by people like Betty Friedman as well as Gloria Steinem, who worked hard to make sure that we had workplace equality. And it was the work of these women that have given us a lot of the rights and freedoms that we enjoy today. So it's 2016. We've got a lot of equality. Why stir the pot, right? Well, when I hear sentiments like this, I'm not going to put a woman on a panel or give her a speaking position just because she's a woman. We don't want to have a token. I realize that there's still work to be done. And while this might be a sentiment that conference organizers say, it's still present in the workplace and it transcends even into the boardroom. Well, you also hear from then speakers who say, well, I don't want to be a token. I mean, who wants to speak and be the token, right? And sometimes people couch their fear by saying, well, I'm not an expert, so why would I want to speak? I'm hoping that my own personal experience will inspire you to get out and speak, whether it's inside your organization or outside. In 2008, when I was the founding engineer of Mint.com, I decided that I wanted to speak at a local code camp. I wanted to share my experiences building the app, launching it, and scaling it. And it really resonated with the audience. I quickly forgot about the talk and kind of moved on, and the years went by. And earlier this year, there was a young woman who was in the audience who came up to me. And what she said was, the talk you gave back in 2008 inspired me to join a startup. I thought if you could do it, just being a couple years out of college, then I could too, and I did. So my little talk at a local code camp that I forgot about inspired one woman to embark on a new journey in her career, and it gave her the courage to do it. Imagine what would happen if we all went out there and we spoke. Now, I'm an engineer, which means I don't want to just inspire you. I want to get you out there and doing stuff. And so one of the concepts that my co-author Karen Catlin and I came up with is the inventory method. And for those of you who are worried about your expertise, the inventory method is going to help you extract that. The way that it works is you are going to take stock of all the projects you've worked on for the last 3 to 12 months. We say 3 to 12 because it's what's freshest in your mind. But also, we're in tech and things move pretty quickly. And as you start to take stock, you'll notice themes emerge. And from that, you'll develop a talk topic. And I don't want you to worry about this being groundbreaking or earth-chattering. It's important to just get out there and speak. 
because your voice may resonate with somebody, regardless of your topic being novel, just like mine did back in 2008 with the young woman. And I know you're probably going to say, well, Purnima, public speaking is really scary. You know, you, you just get up there and do it, but I don't know if I could do it. I get nervous. So I understand this. And to help you out, I'm going to share a technique called power posing. How many of you know power posing? OK, oh, wow, everybody knows it. Well, it's going to be an easy crowd. For the, for the handful of you that aren't familiar, power posing is a phenomenon that cuts across cultures. We see this at the Olympics when people put their hands up after they just won that gold medal. Now, researchers looked into this to see if you could fake it until you make it. And Amy Cuddy was one of those researchers. What her group discovered was that, yes, this act of power posing, if you do it for about two minutes, elevates testosterone, which is a hormone present in all of us. And it makes us feel powerful. Meanwhile, it reduces cortisol, the hormone that causes us to be stressed. So as this effect of testosterone going up and cortisol going down makes us feel powerful and on top of our game, or makes us feel confident before we speak. Now, I teach this at a lot of conferences, and I want all of you to stand up and do it with me today. So everybody get up. Let's do the power pose together. I know we've got a few speakers that are getting ready to go next. So it'll be good. Uh, <laughs> whole yeah, awesome. <laughs> you could do the Wonder Woman. You could do a Superman. Whatever it is that you like. Awesome. You could take a seat now. Thank you. Good morning, Stretch. Now, some of the research has been questioned lately, so I want to share a brief anecdote with you. Back in 2014, I was getting ready to do a TEDx talk. And as I was getting ready, I felt pumped, and I wanted to get up on stage. But moments before I got up on stage, my knees started to shake. And as I walked to that little red circle in the middle of the room, my knees wouldn't stop shaking. And I thought, oh my gosh, I've got stage fright. And I didn't know what to do. But I sort of sucked it up, took a few deep breaths, and I gave my talk. And afterwards, I didn't feel great, but I walked out anyways. And my husband, who was sitting in the audience, came up to me. And he said, great talk. And I thought, are you kidding? Didn't you see my knees? They were like so shaky. And he said, no, you did a great job. And I thought, you know what? You're just saying that because you're my husband, and you got to be supportive. And I walked out into the audience and sea of strangers. And they all said I had done a pretty good job. So I thought, OK, they wouldn't lie to me. A month later, I watched the talk, and sure enough, I had done a pretty good job. And my knees weren't shaky, as I thought. But I never wanted to feel that way again. And when my, my co-author, Karen, told me about this power posing technique, I said, OK, I'll try anything. And ever since then, I do the power pose. In fact, I did it before this talk. And for those of you out there, you know, whether you're going to give a talk or deal with a conflict or just a sticky situation, try it out. A lot of people have mentioned it's been helpful for them to have that ritual. Now, I'm going to end my talk by saying, please, please speak. Right? You might feel as if you're not ready. You might feel like you're not an expert. But your voice can change. And I don't want to be known for having lived in an era where the female voice stagnated. And I don't want to be recognized for living where the female voice ended up undoing all the great work that our foremothers have done to get us the freedoms that we enjoy in the Western world today. And of course, there's going to be those moments where you're going to have to be a token on that panel or at that event or in that boardroom. But accept that challenge. Be the token and be proud of it. Just to give you a little bit more motivation, I'm going to give you copies of my ebook. Feel free to take a picture and download it to get you started. Thank you so much. We have a couple of minutes. Any questions? Of course. Oh, looks like I can't. Can somebody put the ebook slide back up? Oh, it's over there. Okay. Come up. Awesome. Any other questions? Uh, could somebody put the ebook slide back up? I can't with my clicker. Okay, I'm coming. <laughs> Thanks. I think they're working on it. You guys are working on it, right? Thumbs up. Okay. They'll get it up there for you. When you're wanting to begin speaking, and of course you're perhaps new to the tech community and you're not sure where to begin, and I know you've touched on this, but when I've made a list of ideas. Yeah. So, 
when you're stepping up to, say, a conference about doing just a lightning talk, what about reaching out to them and saying, what do you think about these? And ideas like that, I guess, is what I'm fishing for. Yeah, I think it's great to reach out to organizers because the first thing you want to know is like who's going to be sorry the question was how do you, you know do you make a list of topics and reach out to organizers so to answer your question that's a great way to get started especially if you don't know who the audience is going to be or you're concerned that someone else is going to be giving the same talk and so oftentimes working with an organizer whether it's at a conference or an event can help you hone in on what to speak about and who's going to be in the audience and tailor your talk to that audience yeah anyone else Yes. It's going to seem kind of random in one way, but in another way, maybe not. OK, so do you know Superwoman? Of course. OK, the one that's on YouTube? No. Oh, OK. Does anybody know Superwoman that's on YouTube? She's a, uh, you do? OK. So she's really, really, really popular. She's yeah. a YouTube um, sensation. OK. And she happens to be? You know, Indian. Yeah. You know, and not that that means anything, but it does in a way because she's so powerful. Sure. And it's like so exciting to see her. And well, I was going to ask you what you thought about the way she's approaching um, empowering women. You know, she has this whole YouTube show and everything. And she actually has concerts now. She has, she's amazing. She's gone all over the world. And now she has an actual um, program to help girls. It's, okay. it's called Girl Power or Girl Speak or something like that. And so, anyway, that was my question. I was going to ask you about her. Sorry, I haven't. But I'm, I'm not familiar with her, but her, I will check, so. check her out and get better educated. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, yes, Romina. Let's give her a big applause. Thank you. Thank you.